Hello and welcome to another edition of Islava Today on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Hamza Rifa Hassan. Now, the G20 summit recently took place in New Delhi and India. There were lots of joint declarations which actually did take place, many informal in that regard. And India's status as a global power continues to be touted by international media. The question is, with glaring inequalities, challenges to inclusiveness, religious intolerance, can India actually claim to be a major economic power? It's very, very important to understand that India's weak profile needs to be highlighted before we come up with preconceived notions and conclusions. To discuss India's profile, I have with me author and policy analyst Sayyid Hanan, and he is going to be discussing what India's flaws are actually all about and how can India navigate through its difficult road ahead. Hanan, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me, Hamza. So, Hanan, let's start off with the basic question here. The G20 summit, as you know, 2023 took place in New Delhi in India. How do you consider India's profile emerging in the current circumstances? So I think the G20 summit in India um, had, for example, mixed reactions. I think there were points of contention, for example, over the Ukraine war, what countries wanted to agree on. But I think uh, the most telling comment on India's uh, approach to the G20 and multilateralism at large is how India kind of gave away an artificial perception, a uh, projection about it being this prosperous, all-inclusive society. I point to the fact that you had this uh, multi-million, for example, dollar a makeover of New Delhi, which uh, was billed as a beautification campaign, but uh, in essence, it was basically a bringing down of shanty towns, uh, you know, illegal encroachments as well. Uh, that was the rationale that was presented by the government to kind of sideline more of its citizens that were uh, into, into poverty. I mean, critics have pointed out that that has been kind of uh, a recipe to advance thousands more towards poverty. We've seen that there was uh, a green sheet uh, across uh, many of these slums uh, within New Delhi, which raises the question that the definition of a beautiful India uh, under this current regime is to kind of sideline its own citizens, to keep them out of public eye, when the entire purpose should be to lead an inclusive society from within. So I think with that kind of a, I'd say, um, a sidestepping approach towards the citizens about what India wants to project and keeping that a way to give leaders uh, a welcome that they would like is not exactly organic and not authentic to begin with. Okay, absolutely. And you mentioned the glaring inequalities. I mean, if you take a look at New Delhi in general, as you mentioned, billions of dollars were actually spent on making sure that, you know, New Delhi can be pretty much ready for the G20 summit of 2023. But at the very same time, you do have slum areas and people who are actually residing in these slum areas complaining over the fact that they've actually been left behind by a BJP government, which has actually promised, um, you know, in Hindi, it's called Sapka Saat, Sapka Vikas which basically means uh, taking everybody on board and everyone is actually going to be prosperous. But that clearly has not materialized in the India of 2023. Yeah, it hasn't. Um, and I think when you when you look at uh, much of the footage which was reported, of course, having a free and independent press in India is also a challenge we've seen. Uh, you know, uh, government-led riots on, for example, uh, BBC offices, which was reported by Reuters and also covered at large. So I think the space to kind of even highlight these things as reportable facts is also shrinking in, in this, you know, self-proclaimed largest democracy uh, in the world. Uh, but I think when you look when you look a bit deeper into that, I mean, uh, the footage that we saw uh, from residents who were speaking said they could not have access to clean air. Uh, they were forced to kind of keep uh, the basic means of survival um, uh, several weeks in advance. Um, and even many of these people you see, Hamza, uh, are, are wage earners. Uh, they depend on going out, regardless of a summit happening or not, to go out there on other sides of roads and kind of make a living. And the fact that they couldn't come out uh, with the kind of freedom according to their own uh, confessions to media is quite a comment on what India says is its, uh, is its appeal um, to kind of fostering resilient growth. That's something which the Indian issued G20 Leaders Summit points towards, that you know, yeah. we want to take developing countries on board. But is that really uh, an attractive call uh, when the same kind of resilient growth, freedom, rights, inclusiveness, is largely absent in the capital of, uh, you know, the G20 uh, chair for the deal. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about religious inclusiveness. And we're talking about religious intolerance. India obviously has the third largest Muslim population in the world after Indonesia and Pakistan. But we do notice for a fact that the Muslim population within India, under the ambit of a secular constitution, has been witnessing, um, you know, mob lynchings. You have vigilante violence, which is actually taking place. And a vigilante is actually running a mock targeting Muslims uh, within 
uh, the country, which actually constitutes the 13.5% uh, of the population of the second most populous country in the world, and on many accounts it will actually overtake China as well. Now when we talk about India in general, without the Muslim population actually being mainstreamed into the main professions that we're actually talking about, and actually um, you know, their citizenship is being eroded to a large extent by the BJP government, you can't really see a shining India that Narendra Modi actually touts uh, without actually making sure that, you know, Muslims, Christians, and Dalits, and Sikhs are actually, you know, uh, uh, part of the entire process. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, from, from BJP's perspective, in order for them to guarantee that sense of freedom across the board for all minorities, including Muslims, uh, that would basically contradict, uh, you know, its rise to power. Um, so when you look to the fact that since 2014, there's been a drastic rise in attacks against minorities, specifically Muslims. Uh, the, the BJP government has made no uh, secret of kind of leading a Hindu nationalist state. Um, of course, they've been toggling with democratic and uh, demographic changes and in talking to the disputed territory for long. But there's been a long projection to kind of even make sure that Muslims um, do not get the same kind of rights on many levels as does uh, Modi's core uh, vote bank. I mean, you look to the fact that um, recent streams of violence have taken place be it ethnic, be it against Muslim, uh, communal rights. We've seen, you know, footage within which um, leaders empowered by this specific uh, servant government have come up and said, look, our, if you're going to have uh, Muslim, uh, you know, uh, people working in your shop, uh, take that as a warning from us. Uh, they threatened to, to, uh, to take kind of action against those that allow basically Muslims the right to live. And you know, you've heard it from confessions in specific districts as well. Um, that, you know, Muslims leading families are just scared to go out to do what, you know, which any responsible person should do, to yeah. go out and make a living uh, out of, out of hard-earned money. So I think that only scratches to the surface of what um, the BJP -like government is doing. And I think the fact that India has kind of forced key allies, including on certain levels the United States, to have these discussions privately and not exactly give visibility is one indicator uh, of the extent to which India will go to keep this uh, kind of spot on its you know, uh, on this democratic projection away from public scrutiny and the fact that, you know, free media, these international organizations have also been the subject of scandals, uh, journalists being arrested, uh, Muslim activists, obviously, as you pointed out, with the lynching and everything, you know, these, these things picking up. And I think the fact that we don't see, we see a lot of promises. I mean, um, Prime Minister Narendra Modi recently came up when the ethnic, I think, violence uh, took a toll and said, look, we're going to, we're going to go up and we're going to take a very, very hard stance. We're all about tolerance and, you know, going forward with that. But what do we have to show for it? I mean, how many people have been indicted? What kind of steps have been taken? Uh, who's responsible? Uh, so I think the entire bureaucratic machinery in many of the states dominated by the BJP uh, have very little space to kind of market the interests of Muslims and minorities at large uh, because, one, it's not politically opportune. Second, uh, when press freedom and key strategic partners are not allowed that space, it's basically a mirage a dream to think uh, that, you know, uh, independent activists and, uh, and government officials will also have that space. So, yes, hate speech has been on the rise, attacks against minorities are large, and now uh, threatening their basic livelihoods in key, key districts. Well, no, let's talk about democratic backsliding. Obviously, that is a trend that's been witnessed as far as the Narendra Modi government is concerned. Talk about democratic backsliding. Many channels are actually being banned. You have journalists who have been incarcerated. You also have this trend of making sure that they can muzzle out the opposition. You don't really see Rahul Gandhi coming out from the Indian National Congress beyond, you know, these uh, few yatras that he does take place or these little pilgrimages that he takes place within India to try and unite the entire community. But even then, when we talk about Rahul Gandhi in general, you don't see the same sort of coverage being provided to the opposition. Many countries in the G20, Hanan, are also democracies. Not all of them, but, you know, many of them are also democracies. When we talk about democracies in general, they would actually, uh, you know, it's, it's worth highlighting that India's controversial record as far as democracy is concerned, uh, with backsliding take place, that is also something that actually weakens and dampens their profile in the G20 as well. It does. Uh, and that's one of many points of failures, I think, for the G20, flatly put. I mean, um, you don't have to look for, for example, uh, key gaps in how governance is being conducted in certain countries based on regimes of the autocracy, the democracy metric. You need to focus on whether or not uh, you know, existing democracies who, who claim to have a very open and easy atmosphere of freedom are they actually living up to their expectations. I mean, India has dropped uh, several points uh, to, I think, what could be one of the record lows in the, in, in the world, uh, you know, press freedom index as well. Uh, and I think when you look to, to other metrics as well, for example, the fact that um, under uh, the current government, uh, there hasn't 
hasn't been that kind of an atmosphere where, you know, uh, New Delhi has taken the initiative to say, look, uh, we're all for democracies being together. G20 represents a very powerful bloc. Here's what we have to show for it. Here's how we're going to deliver on it. Instead, what we see is that, you know, the declaration itself makes a lot of promises about economic integration, about resilient growth, about, you know, a bit on technology as well, and, you know, uh, partnering together and moving forward. Uh, but there's not a lot on how, uh, you know, a country with such a huge population can basically take all colors of its social fabric together. You talk about opposition politics. Look, the Rahul Gandhi case was a pretty straightforward one. Um, he made remarks which were, you know, uh, pretty controversial. But the fact that it was brought up and used to put him behind bars uh, yeah. did not exactly have yeah. that kind of due process of fair trial expectation which people would deserve. And I've talked about this as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that, you know, uh, resentment to Modi right now, uh, we do see the fact that uh, Rahul Gandhi's, uh, you know, party was part of the coalition called India as the abbreviation to kind of challenge it. Um, but they basically don't have the muscle as well as the kind of traction with this hard, uh, you know, uh, Hindu World Bank that would basically determine uh, the crux, the backbone uh, of BJP's electioneering. So I think when you take all those things together, India's G20 leadership has been extremely silent on its own record and rights. So I think in some ways India is ill-positioned to preach what democratic values should look like when we see them becoming a fading memory at home. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when we talk about Rahul Gandhi in general, I think it's also important to point out that you mentioned the Press Freedom Index. I mean, I had Karan Thapar, one of India's prominent journalists, on my show, and he basically claimed that India is actually ranked behind Sri Lanka, which has just recently witnessed the Rajapaksa regime being you know, dethroned, and Pakistan, which is considered to be a hybrid democracy. So India's Press Freedom Index, the fact that it's actually, you know, going down the doldrums, clearly shows that even within the region, it just doesn't have that sort of profile. So coming towards when we talk about the status of Sikhs in India, now the Sikh community, uh, which is predominantly a Punjab, they contribute a considerable amount to the Indian GDP as far as agricultural growth is concerned. And obviously you have the Sikh diaspora abroad, you have them in the United Kingdom, you have in Australia, you have in the United States as well. One key fundamental point to becoming a major regional power is their ability to actually nullify and neutralize secessionist movements. But we've witnessed, Hanan, since the BJP government has come into power, the Khalistan movement for an independent state for the Sikhs in India has actually gained more traction, whether it's in Australia and the United Kingdom. They passed a referendum in Australia in 2021, and you've seen it in the US as well as in the UK. So clearly, the Khalistan problem, which is economic, which deals with identity, which deals with religion, is another issue which is a glaring, you could say, a blip on India's profile to become a G20 leader. Absolutely. And I think, you know, let's be clear to your audience as well. Um, the facts are out there. It's just that uh, the government in power does not want you to emphasize that. So much of the stuff that we're talking about is not new knowledge. It's been there for a long time. Uh, the fact is that the level of emphasis being put on those from officials is next to enough. Uh, and I think when you talk about the Khalistan movement, look, we've seen referendums in many Western capitals as well. I think the frustration on New Delhi's part has been so much that rather than addressing the reservations, the underlying grievances, let's go back decades, Hamza. This was unfinished business, and those reservations towards how uh, the center has treated the, uh, you know, their quest for national identity integration has basically been unfinished business. So those grievances have simmered over time, and now it has come to a point where it was pushed to shove. I think one of the prominent Sikh leaders, for example, um, the, uh, you know, the, the message from the center was that we want to have a manhunt for this particular person. But at the same time, New Delhi was also engaged in signaling to key Western governments that, look, we don't want these kind of minority protests in front of our consulates. We don't want them to be organized. But the signal uh, from key Western capitals was that, look, there's this freedom of expression, this freedom of assembly. We're Actually, just going to let it happen. Yeah. 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 But, but I think where uh, the onus falls on India's uh, democratic strategic partners, Canada, United States, UK, with the kind of machinery, the diversity at home, uh, a greater record of minority tolerance, when, for example, regardless of the divisions coming forward, the onus falls on them to to kind of come up with much more than just rhetoric and say, look, uh, we're going to tighten the screws on India uh, for a start. We're gonna we're gonna we're not gonna shy away from engaging with India. Talk about markets and industrialization, but telling them, look, uh, human rights are fundamental values, which we Absolutely. want you to focus on, and addressing them concerns our people. Uh, and I think that's where the audacity has lacked. Um, even though um, such a stance would be principled when you look to the fact that it would be admirable because it aligns with democratic values, with human values. And I think the more India doesn't do that, look, India's, uh, the BJP, 
approach to um, to, to uh, resolving differences, be it ethnic, be it you know what it calls secessionist, has been a very very sweeping. One. So, for example, it's very easy to declare uh, you know um, a particular movement that you don't want to address or even cater to as secessionist. Uh, India has used very liberally, and this is verifiable. You can look it up. Uh, the way it has kind of tried to stamp out dissent in Indian occupied Kashmir by using the word of terror. So, for example, Kashmir, uh, Kashmiri's independent UN guaranteed right to self determination has been explained away as terrorism um, to the advantage of India's occupation. So, I think there, there's a common thread here that India does not want to engage or kind of come up with these delicate issues where it wants, where, where it will be forced to kind of include these various segments into its national fabric or granting democratic freedoms, what does it do? It liberally uses the secessionist card, it liberally uh, explains away many forms of justifiable defense as terrorism, and says, look, we want our partners to look the other way, that's the only way that we can engage in a long-term path. So I think the onus falls on uh, India's democratic partners who had a greater experience kind of working through these delicate negotiations, and have made no secret of standing by democratic values, but those should also apply to India. Yeah, absolutely. It should apply to India. So, Hanan, the G20 is all about economy. We're talking about the 20 largest economies in the world. Um, they've had varying uh, degrees of growth rates, but India's growth rate is actually very impressive. It's just behind China, and in many different ways, it actually overtakes China to a large extent. It's also, the Indian economy is also larger than the UK by many metrics. But one of the key aspects of the economy is the health of the economy. And, you know, I was actually watching the Deutschwell uh, documentary the other day, and they actually claimed that India's unemployment rate is amongst the highest in the developing world. You have fresh Indian graduates coming out of IIT, and we're talking about domestic graduates for that matter, IIT, and we're talking about uh, JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and they just can't find jobs in the Indian job market. That actually contributes to greater social, in, um, you could say, uh, social, uh, you know, in, uh, inability to actually integrate. You do see a considerable amount of unemployment actually increasing, and you also see a lot of inequality as well. So, given that this is a trend within India, it cannot really tout itself as a very healthy economy, despite impressive GDP growth rate figures. Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, when we talk about economics, I think uh, fast and fast-growing GDP do not explain the entire story behind it. So, yeah. uh, I think that's that's the kind of a distinction for which one needs to draw. So, when you look deeper into the numbers, I think um, um, there's a broad consensus that India may not be able to sustain the same kind of growth rate. Um, you know, um, in the coming time, for example, into next year, it's going to take a lot for them to do it. You talk about an employment rate that has a lingering concern. So, for example, uh, one of the backbones of uh, most appeal to voters was that, you know, this is going to be a dynamic, well-rounded economy. No doubt, investments have been coming in, but the fact is and that many young graduates, like you pointed out, uh, by the legions are not being able to find those kind of jobs. The point of key reference points, so for example, when you had the COVID-19 pandemic kicking in, uh, the government had basically uh, built uh, a post-COVID a recovery plan as key to revitalizing the economy. What happened? Uh, it was catered to larger enterprises. Middle and small income enterprises were, were taken on. And if you look to uh, the, the, the test cases of uh, certain parts of India, as well as big economies such as China, uh, small and medium enterprises uh, are a major point of focus. They were when that happened. So when you look towards how resources are being allocated, which particular uh, mediums of investments are being prioritized and how things are happening, um, the the reality is far more grim than a uh, single figure kind of uh, risk conveying. And I think in order for India to kind of correct that, it's going to be a larger affair. So, for example, when you have um, that kind of a growth rate coming in, uh, are all provinces, uh, are all states across kind of benefiting in the same ways? Um, India, uh, obviously, we've seen um, in, in recent years, uh, many countries have made gains against poverty, uh, but as India the you know allocation and you know big questions surrounding how it's approaching poverty and the way these these key funds are being utilized the bigger enterprise not the small and medium raises questions about okay uh, you're having access to education in some areas but then of course when those when you have a new fresh pile coming in and you want to activate that as part of your labor force participation what does uh, you know a recurring absence of jobs for for key talent indicate it indicates that there's a lot of room for improvement and the fact that the B JP has been quick to point and celebrate investments coming from partners that would obviously invest in it based on certain uh, market considerations and growth values. But the same BJP administration hasn't been very forthcoming when it comes to these deficiencies in India's economy and considers admission there as a, as, a, as, a, as a form of weakness. So that is going to be 
uh, a key test of leadership on how transparent India is about its economic opportunity, sure, but about the challenges that underpin it. Absolutely. Now let's talk about the global south. I mean, you know, you talk about Africa, you talk about South America as well. There, there are many countries within the global south which are looking forward to the prospect of the very fact that the G20 can play a constructive influence to try and make sure it's not about doling out money, but to try and make sure that they can, you know, build institutions in those countries, uh, many of them which are actually flawed democracies. Some of them are also members of the G20 for that matter. India, on the other hand, has not really been playing a constructive influence in the region. We talk about disputes with neighboring Pakistan. Pakistan accuses India of fomenting terrorism within its territory. Uh, India's influence in Afghanistan has waned since the Taliban government has assumed power in 2021 in Kabul. And we also see negative, you could say, sentiments in countries such as Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and even Bhutan and Nepal, for that matter, uh, regarding India's role. So G20 or the G20 platform is to try and make sure that they can play a constructive role in global affairs and also to make sure that they can resuscitate the global financial system. But India's regional profile, since the Narendra Modi government has assumed power, is actually very controversial. What do you have to say about that? I think I think uh, that was absolutely on point, and I think if I would build on that, I'd say that um, much of India's homework and its, uh, its credibility starts from home, and I think the picture from there doesn't look so great. I mean, you look at the fact that um, key organizations such as the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, which obviously does not have the best of records in cooperating, but that um, a part of it is due to India's uh, you know implicit move to sidestep any form of meaningful economic and political engagement with its regional partners. I think. And the narrative about, you know, the accusation that India has worked Pakistan for long about terrorism is something that many other countries have uh, have outgrown, have tested, have verified, and uh, have simply not, uh, have simply hasn't stuck. But I think uh, the growing realization over there is that it should India try to engage with Pakistan, it will be confronted with the key challenge of addressing sticking points, including India's sustained occupation on Kashmir and how it is basically encroaching the same rights that it wants the world to guarantee the developing power. So I think. And there's there's a conscious effort there to to not engage on key areas. We talked about Nepal. Our reservations are there uh, are high over there, for example, to not present itself as this uh, platform for a great power showdown between India and China. Uh, Sri Lanka, of course, has been extremely skeptical of India, uh, and I think it's important to inform your viewers that during the time when Sri Lanka faced its most bloody civil war at the hands of um, you know uh, the Tamil uh, Elam terrorists, um, India was known. To harbor militant sanctuaries, to kind of even uh, lead and give the space, logistical space, train space to these terrorists who were again attacking Sri Lankan state. So I think when we talk about state sponsored terrorism, many of those reservations run deep. So I think putting all that together and then Afghanistan back to, of course, um, India's uh, desire not to integrate South Asia uh, based on this, you know, a, a truly multilateral practice is something that is damaging its own credibility. I just want to. Very quick reference point. So the fact yeah, that on the sidelines of the G20, uh, the uh, Indian Middle Eastern European Corridor was announced. Uh, this is an ambitious project, which was being, um, you know, hailed as a game changer, um, and basically looks to connect uh, two key corridors, um, all the way from the Arabian Gulf to India, and then of course from Europe to the Arabian Gulf. Um, the problem over there is, is that when you talk about linking to South Asia, uh, the, the corridor extends to India. And I would not reduce the credibility, the rights of South Asian integration to simply India. It needs to include Pakistan. It needs to include Afghanistan. Afghanistan is in dire need of integration. I mean, I'm no fan of the Taliban regime. I think, you know, we all know um, at the roots of that regime and the the, uh, the people who are basically running it. Uh, but the fact remains that there's a humanitarian crisis that can be spent should these corridors be. So, I mean, to, to reduce the entire strategic value of a region to India and say this is South Asian integration when India benefits is the wrong system. And basically corroborates uh, the impression uh, that India is just not serious about integrating South Asia. So when you look at those those platforms, India's ability to kind of go towards the larger Asia Pacific, go towards Southeast Asia, you know, kind of move towards the Middle East, but not give South Asia the kind of credibility that it deserves in order to kind of substantiate India's own case for G20 leadership uh, is a big vacuum. Which I think no amount of rhetoric or a photo op, but with key leaders, can basically just explain away. So no multilateral platform is actually devoid of politics. We've seen President Joe Biden trying to leverage the G20 for America's own political objectives, and many of the countries actually echo those, uh, you know, those concerns, well, with the exception of maybe China and Russia, for that matter. But India is often touted as a regional power that can be an integral part of America's 
um, you know, Pacific shift. You talk about the Indo-Pacific strategy. Obviously, the Chinese would disagree. They would call it the Asia-Pacific strategy, but or the Asia-Pacific, you could say, prism through which we are supposed to view things. But America's quest to try and, you know, make sure that India plays a more pronounced role in the Asia-Pacific can actually be it can actually backfire on Washington D.C. because India also has very good relations with Russia. We're talking about oil deals. We're talking about cooperation. We're also talking about weaponry, which is actually exported by Russia to India. And the fact that Russia is actually engaged in an invasion of Ukraine also dents Russia's credibility and to a large extent India's credibility. But that's not really covered in the mainstream press. Yeah, it isn't. And I think uh, I just decode that one by one. So when you talk about Indian inclusion within the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, there's some elements of that strategy which qualify as relative strength, some of them not so much. So I think within the strength, I think there's a, there's a stronger, I'd say, um, realization on Washington's part that it needs to make its brand of a rules-based order where economic principles are respected, market practices are upheld, kind of resonate with key groupings such as the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So I think there's a bit of an ideological credibility there to that strategy. But when you look at the metrics being employed, for example, India's inclusion, let's not fool ourselves of being in, in, in an imagined paradise. India is in this for its own self. It wants to attract a whole lot of investment to kind of build its manufacturing. We see it pivot towards, you know, smart and advanced techno uh, technological development with microchips and many of the uh, key suppliers and manufacturers from telecoms to technology are also looking to kind of build their bases uh, and kind of kind of uh, bring India into its, its sphere of influence. So I think India wants to benefit technologically, diplomatically, and even in terms of, for example, what U.S. red lines were that, you know, for example, at the start of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, I didn't want a lot of flexibility for countries to engage in financial transactions with Russia to look for alternate mechanisms for oil and everything. It was even an effort to convince Europe that, look, we're going to look to the Gulf, but you don't need to depend on Russia. And India seems to be doing all, all, all that. And the United States, when it has come to India's economy, by doing all those things and projecting multipolarity towards an invading power, um, you know, how the U.S. sees it, uh, then, of course, you know, uh, the kind of criticism that many other developing countries have faced, India has been immune to it. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's a clear impression of exceptionalism when it comes to India, and that does not sit well when you talk about India being a credible partner within the broader ambitions that the U.S. looks to fulfill within the Indo-Pacific. You talked about uh, the global south. I think uh, many countries, for example, the African Union's inclusion within the G20 was a welcome move, but this was being promoted by many other parties. I mean, China was a, was a, was a key partner to this initiative. We know that uh, without Washington, principal lobbying for AU seats, this wouldn't have been possible. So many of the declarations made at this summit were not necessarily India's own imperative. Um, they follow a larger process that has just come to fruition. So yes, yeah, uh, India's, I say, quest for engaging with every single power uh, makes it less reliable to the United States to, to kind of come forward on specific objectives. Yeah. All right. Policy analyst and author Hanan, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Pleasure. So that's all that we have from Islamabad today on Think Tech Hawaii. You can follow us on our social media pages for all the latest feedback. Do provide us with your comments. We value them considerably and take very good care of ourselves. Mm -hmm.